Chapter 6, Section 1 This video is an introduction to the structure of cellular membranes. Cellular membranes are important because they surround every single living cell on this planet. It doesn't matter if you're a bacteria, an archaean, a plant cell, or an animal cell like these human cheek cells. You're surrounded by a plasma membrane. And just to make this clear, even plant cells, like you can see those LED leaves, they have a cell wall, and on the inside of that cell wall is a plasma membrane. By knowing the structure of a cellular membrane, we can begin to understand its function. So first of all, if you're a bacteria or a eukarya, you're surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer that looks something like this on your right. It's got two fatty acid chains attached to a glycerol with a phosphate head. Archaea use a similar but different phospholipid. It's actually quite important for archaea, but not so much for us right here. One of the important properties of cellular membranes is that they are amphipathic. Now what that means is you have a phosphate head, and there it is highlighted. The phosphate head is very hydrophilic. Look at all those oxygens. They're capable of forming hydrogen bonds with water, hence they're water-loving. The fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. They're full of carbon and hydrogen, and they have no real way of forming hydrogen bonds with water. Here's a very simplified drawing of a phospholipid bilayer. There's one layer, and as you can see, there's another layer below it, hence the name bilayer. Bi means two, so this is a phospholipid bilayer. The inside has these fatty acid tails, and you'll notice there are only two of them drawn for each one of the phosphate heads. Now what that means is there's a hydrophobic interior. That's very important, and the exterior is hydrophilic. These membranes actually form on their own. Those hydrophobic fatty acid tails, they don't like to be anywhere near water. So they turn around and form toward themselves, kicking those hydrophilic phosphate heads out toward the water. Here's a more accurate illustration of a cellular membrane. We call it the fluid mosaic model. When you look at this, it's more than just phospholipids. There are also lots of proteins embedded in it. And in fact, if you were to take any cellular membrane and extract all the proteins from it, it would be about 50% by weight proteins. Now those proteins are embedded in the membrane and they're kind of moving around, at least some of them. Others could be anchored by what we call the cytoskeleton. Now it gets the term fluid mosaic model because membranes are kind of like a soap bubble. They're kind of moving around. Each one of those phospholipids can switch places with each other and the proteins can kind of float around on there unless they're anchored to something. Hence the name fluid mosaic model. Fluid because the membranes are all moving around and a mosaic of proteins embedded within the membrane. Cellular membranes are really important for maintaining homeostasis. Now recall, homeostasis is maintaining an internal environment that is different from the outside world. So for example, if you ever heard of maintaining an electrolyte balance, that would be maintaining homeostasis, and that also helps with maintaining our water balance as well. Cellular membranes have something called selective permeability. Now only certain substances can readily move across the cellular membrane, and this has to do, of course, with its form. Small molecules, like carbon dioxide, free oxygen, they can easily move across a cellular membrane. The reason why is because they're small and they're hydrophobic, so they easily go through that hydrophobic interior. Water can still go through it. Even though water is a polar molecule, it can cross the membrane because it's a small molecule. However, if it was much larger, it wouldn't go as fast, and it still doesn't move through the membrane quite as quickly as carbon dioxide or free oxygen. Not every substance can cross through a cellular membrane. Your electrolytes, for example, these are your ions like potassium and sodium and calcium and chloride ions along with hydrophilic molecules that are larger than water, like sugars and amino acids. They are unable to pass through that hydrophobic interior. And that hydrophobic interior is what gives a membrane selective permeability. So you have to have ways of moving these things across a membrane. And we'll come back to that in section 6.3. Life on this planet can be found in a lot of different environments. You can find life and water that's practically hot enough to boil. And you can also find life in very cold environments. And as you might have guessed, 
temperature strongly affects membrane fluidity. If you're a fish living in very cold environments, you have to have membranes that are acclimated to this type of environment. So one way you do that is you create fatty acids that are shorter and unsaturated. And being unsaturated is really important. So cells can regulate membrane fluidity. And what they do is they create all of these unsaturated lipids. They don't stack easy. And what that does is that keeps a membrane fluid in cold temperatures. It's like stacking paper. If they're all saturated and flat, they're going to stack very easily. If they're kinked and bent, it's like wadding your paper up. They won't stack as easily. Another representation. Think about bacon grease versus olive oil. Well, if you got bacon grease at room temperature, it becomes a solid. Whereas olive oil is a liquid at room temperature. And that's because it's full of unsaturated fats. If you're living in a cold environment, the way you do that to keep your membranes fluid and from sticking together is you keep them short and satur unsaturated. Life can also be found in really hot environments. This is a geyser from Yellowstone, and the water there is practically boiling, and yet there are bacteria and archaean living there in that geyser. So, how do you have a membrane that doesn't become too fluid when it becomes warm? Well, the way you do this is you make the fatty acids longer and more saturated, and that helps them stick together. So, as your environment gets warmer and warmer and warmer, you're going to make your tails longer and more saturated. That's how you regulate membrane fluidity. So saturated lipids, they're able to stick together, keeping the membrane fluid and warm to very hot temperatures. Animals have one other way of maintaining membrane fluidity. They use cholesterol. And if you look at this molecule, you can see on the right side, it's all carbon and hydrogen. And that's going to go down into those fatty acid tails. That lone hydroxyl group on the left side, what that's going to do is that's going to match in with the phosphate groups. Now what cholesterol does is if it becomes warmer and warmer and warmer, cholesterol prevents your membrane from becoming too fluid. Likewise, as you get colder and colder, it will be prevent it from getting too rigid. Now remember, you want to maintain proper membrane fluidity because the reason why, if it becomes too rigid, then nothing can get past it. So for example, if your membranes all of a sudden became rigid, oxygen could not get into your cells, carbon dioxide could not get out, and you would die. On the other hand, if your membrane became way too fluid, then what would happen is, well, you couldn't regulate anything. All the water and electrolytes would just be randomly moving across your cells, and you could no longer maintain homeostasis, and that wouldn't be good either. Let's end with a health connection. You may have heard that eating cold water fish is good for you, like salmon here. And the reason why is because, well, they live in cold water and they have to regulate membrane fluidity. So they produce a lot of polyunsaturated fats. And if you remember from the other chapter, when we talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly fats, the good fats were the polyunsaturated fats because they've been known to help prevent heart disease and artery disease. So cold water fish is good for you, and now you know why. Now, like all, all things being said, you don't have to start going and drinking a gallon of fish oil a day. Just a little bit is enough. The very last thing I want to do is clarify some terminology. Whenever I talk about a cellular membrane, that's a membrane that surrounds every plant, animal, fungus cell, every bacteria cell, and most archaeans as well. And it also includes all the membranes inside of eukaryotes, ones for chloroplasts, mitochondria, and all the endomembrane system. These are all cellular membranes. We also call them plasma membranes. And I've kind of said this before. When you look at those individual phospholipids, they can move around. They can move around a lot, actually. And in fact, they're swapping places almost a million times a second. So cellular membranes are plasma membranes. And there are also phospholipid bilayers, at least for the bacteria and the eukarya. Believe it or not, there's actually a couple of archaeans out there that don't have a phospholipid bilayer. They actually have a phospholipid layer. But we don't have to worry about that here.